in our weekend flash sale, you'll get 12 weeks of the magazine in print and online for just £12. And we'll also send you a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label Scotch Whiskey. Mm. To become a subscriber today, go to spectator.co.uk slash flash sale Brexit. The clock continues to tick down to December the 31st. That's when the transition period to leave the EU ends. Only two weeks, though, until the EU's December summit. And that's the latest time any deal can be struck. Well, probably. Probably not sensible to be too definitive about this these days. We know how the negotiators like to push things to the last minute. Let's go on to Mark Arcard, who knows all about this. I'm joined by Ivan Rogers. He worked closely with David Cameron and Theresa May on Europe, formerly the UK's permanent representative to the EU in Brussels. Uh, Ivan Rogers, welcome to Spectator TV. Thank you for joining us. Just, I know this is uh, difficult to, to answer, but how, how would you assess the state of the talks as they stand? Well, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me on. Um, look, it's very fraught. It's not surprising it's fraught. Um, we're now coming to a crunch point where real decisions have to be taken on both sides as to where the compromise is, if there is one. I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, it's not been, been moving very fast over the last uh, few weeks. I don't think it's moved very fast this week. Uh, I think there'll be further developments this weekend. I would be surprised if there weren't, but I'm not sure we are quite yet in the final straight. My, own view, my own view is that you know markets and indeed some of the commentators at this end have got a little bit too optimistic. Uh, markets are pricing in about a 75 to 80% chance of a deal. I don't think it's anything like that high because I think a number of the issues left on the table are extremely difficult to solve, but it's not insoluble. It is interesting though, the issues that the, the, the real sticking points that seem to be left on, on, on one side, you've got state subsidies, we use that as a shorthand. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of interesting that a conservative government, which is broadly meant to be against state subsidies, is kind of hanging out for state subsidies, uh, particularly since we use them a lot less than even the Germans. And on the EU side, it's fish, particularly President Macron, which is important if you're in the fishing industry, but hardly central to the future of the EU or the United Kingdom. Yes, although fish, of course, was a massive issue on the way into the European Economic Community yes, in 1973. Was. So, you know, we've been here before and on exit, the same, the same issues arise as on. <laughs> subsidies is an odd one. I suppose what the European side might say is this isn't a classic British Conservative government. Yes, we've on the whole spent far less in terms of state subsidies than French or Germans or other core European members. And very deliberately so under both Conservative and Labour governments I've worked for. It's quite hard to argue, and obviously we're in a different world post-COVID anyway, in terms of what this government would want to do and how it would want to do it. It's quite difficult if you look at the, this government from a European perspective to think of it as a classic low tax, low spend, Thatcherite government. It obviously isn't. Indeed. So I think there's nervousness, not just in the classic old Western European capitals, uh, Paris and Berlin, but also in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe about what the UK might do by way of subsidies, which sort of tilts the playing field against their own companies on their own market. Uh, as you, we look back at the, 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 the talks, a lot of things jump out. Let me put two that jumped out to me. I'm sure you've got, got many more. One is it, it's pretty clear to me that the British never realised how difficult it was going to be. But certainly the British politicians yeah. never realised how difficult this was going to be. Uh, and another thing that does jump out to me, too, is that Mr. Barnier and his team, or maybe even the EU as a whole, didn't quite clock the watershed change for the negotiations that moving from Theresa May to the Johnson government uh, indicated, symbolised. Yeah, I think that's right on both counts. Um... Obviously, when I was still there in government in autumn 2016, an awful lot of ministers uh, were not just saying publicly that this was the easiest trade negotiation in history, but they were saying that privately and they thought it was the work of months or perhaps weeks. Some were saying days. And why did they think that? Because they thought we were aligned on day one because we'd been members for the last 45 years and therefore our rule book was the same as the European rule book. And I kept on saying, yes, I understand that, but you left and you wanted to leave and you wanted to leave presumably because you wanted to divert 
quite radically on that rule book because you didn't like being bound by that rule book. So the fact that you're convergent on day one doesn't really make an awful lot of difference to your negotiating opposite numbers. They want to know where you want to be on day two or day 200 or day 2000. And they assume you have some radically different destination in mind. Otherwise, why would you have left? And I think we got caught up on that. I mean, that took ages and it was a very sterile debate within Whitehall in 2016. And we've been caught up on that for a long time. Then on the difference between Theresa May's version of Brexit and Boris Johnson's, Look, I, I was very early on saying, I mean, pretty much from the point I resigned, if not before the point I resigned, I never thought Theresa May's version of Brexit would succeed because I didn't see how she could get it through the House of Commons. She couldn't get it through her own party. And therefore, unless she reached out to the Labour Party and moderates in the Labour Party and had a bipartisan approach, it was always going to fail. So I was privately saying to some old friends on the European side of the table, I know you think you sort of got there with her with a deal which will fly, but I don't think it'll fly. I think it'll tank. Then when it did tank, it was less of a shock, of course, by the time they'd been through three or four iterations of her failing in the House of Commons. But then when Johnson arrives, he wants a radically different version of Brexit because he wants it to be more mid-Atlantic, more buccaneering and more divergent. Mm. And it took then some time for them to digest what that was. I think it took some time as well for the British side to digest that where they said they just wanted a bog standard, skinny free trade agreement, which looked a bit like Canada. The other side was saying, well, actually, you want something deeper than Canada on multiple issues where the Canadians don't have a major trade relationship with us. And therefore, we're still going to apply this benighted level playing field conditionality to you. And that will be a sine qua known for a duty free, quota free deal. So, yeah, I mean, I'm afraid this is a history. Maybe you could say this is a 48 year history of misreadings of each other's politics and incentives <laughs> on both sides. You could say it's a 400 year history. Certainly the last four or five years have been characterized by huge misreadings on both sides of each other's incentives, I think. Do you uh, agree that even if we get a deal, that it won't be Canada plus plus plus? That it, uh, we were talking on Spectator TV last week uh, with uh, Wolfgang Mungcha, formerly of the Financial Times, yeah. that it's actually the best way to describe it is probably Canada dry, dry. Yeah, I think that's much closer to the mark. I mean, in my little book of about two years ago, I, I made some jokes at the expense of Canada plus plus and said, you know, beware of any deals with loads of pluses in them, because the pluses are all the kinds of things that you wanted in addition to Canada, which the other side isn't necessarily prepared to give you. So I think it would be pretty thin, in all honesty. I mean, it won't be thin in terms of volume. It's still six or 700 pages long, what David Frost is in the process of negotiating with Michel Buddy. There's no such thing as a short trade treaty. I've never experienced such a thing. But yes, it won't be. It'll be much stronger, obviously, on goods than on services. That's essentially a British choice. Uh, it's an interesting choice, which dates back you know, many years. And we wanted to be divergent on services. It'll be thinner than I think we could have negotiated and probably I would have wanted to negotiate given a free hand. But I always thought that we were leaving the single market and the customs union, because if you want to end free movement of people and end budgetary contributions and take back control of laws and borders, you are leaving the single market. If you want a sovereign and autonomous trade policy, you can't be living in a customs union. So I always thought we would end up with a free trade agreement and said so, you know, from June the 24th, 2016. The question is, what's the substance of the trade agreement and how deep or how shallow do you want to go? Is there a possibility, I don't wish to frighten our viewers, but is there a possibility that these negotiations never really end? That, that if there is a deal, the EU will make it conditional by saying, all right, you can have this kind of state subsidy regime, if that's what you want, we're not going to interfere. Here it is on fishing, here it is on other things. But we the reserve the right regularly to come back to see if you're complying with the spirit and the letter of our deal. And if you're not, we will then reopen the matter or we will reduce the, the, the uh, openness of our market to yours. Oh, I think that's pretty inevitable. I mean, let's say we get a deal, and I hope we do, because I think it's a better world than a no-deal world. And no-deal world is a slightly a world of purgatory, because lots of things ranging from, you know, road haulage to electricity and gas to aviation to fisheries, in the end, you sooner or later have to sort in a legal deal. So I don't think no-deal is a terminus. You still have to solve things. 
What's going to happen then? The UK is going to say, well, we're sovereign and autonomous and free now. We want to do our own thing in our own way and legislate in our own interest. That's obviously what a government will do, what the House of Commons will do. There'll be occasions, and I suspect they'll be quite often, where the European Union side will say, but hang on, that's no longer convergent with the same purposes and not delivering the same outcomes as, as we had agreed at the time we signed and ratified the free trade agreement with you. And if that's where you're going on this bit of environmental legislation or social legislation or taxation or subsidy legislation, yes, we will then uh, retaliate and remove market access. And that's indeed what they're discussing a lot in the room at the moment, the circumstances under which you would be able to take the other party to arbitration and dispute resolution and the circumstances in which you'd be able to retaliate against each other and what that retaliation, what I know the British side is very fearful of is what the EU has frequently used against Switzerland over the last 25 years, which is sort of cross retaliation where they can hit you where it hurts outside the domain in which you've allegedly committed the offence. I want to bring James in in a second just as we come to an end here, but, but let me ask you another question. Let's assume there's a deal it's a bit scratchy, the negotiations don't quite go away, but Britain's uh, on its own, off in some direction. The EU is there, unencumbered now by the United Kingdom. What I've not been able to discern yet is, is any kind of indication of what that means now for the EU without Britain always kind of holding them back. I, I don't yet see a, a direction for the EU uh, a more integrated EU, an EU that can go places that the British would have tried to stop them, either coming out of Paris or coming out of Berlin. Am I missing something? Well, I think there's one area in which they've moved in a way they wouldn't have been able to do had we been there, and that is the recovery package on COVID, because they tied in that recovery package, which involves giving the European Commission massive borrowing powers, and raising the so-called own resources ceiling, the amount uh, of revenue that the union can raise as a union. Uh, they've done that deal and tied it in with their multi-annual financial framework, which is the jargon for their seven year budget period. And frankly, any government I ever worked for would have vetoed that package. And because we weren't there- you also, you're, you're quite clear that the British, if we had still been in, we would, we would have, have vetoed, vetoed that. We would have vetoed that under any government I ever worked for, Labour or Conservative in my view. Right. So that is a change. Uh, they would have had, we, you know, where I came in in 2011 was when David Cameron tried um, essentially to stop the fiscal compact treaty and deliver a quid pro quo for the British side via, via that treaty. And the French and Germans decided to go round him um, and go via an intergovernmental treaty outside the treaties. And it's at that point that he decides they found a way around me and I'll have to go for an in out referendum. I tried to tell that story in one or two lectures I've given over recent years. We're, we would have done the same and said, this is not acceptable. It's essentially a Eurozone fiscal package, not a European Union one. We don't accept a doubling of the own resources ceiling or the capacity for the European Commission to borrow on the markets, because the European Commission is now becoming a major borrower on the markets on huge scale. I, I can't think of a British government I work for that would have accepted that. So that's the one area so far where you've seen a development, a big institutional development, where I think the European Union has done something or is in the process of doing something that it couldn't have done without us. Maybe they do some similar things on defence, where we were always the blockage. I personally was frequently the blockage or on preventing uh, the Union doing things which we thought uh, contradicted what we wanted to do under NATO. The risk for us is obviously that on both trade and financial services, they start behaving in a much more difficult way, which has impacts, negative impacts on us, even though we're outside the union, because the centre of gravity of the union has moved in a, in a less British and less Anglo-Saxon direction, if I can put it.